Paul Simon is joining us. Paul Simon? Paul Simon. Paul Simon. People used to say, oh, you have your finger on the pulse. No, I don't have my finger on the pulse. I just have my finger out there. And the pulse is running under. I've never wanted to be anything other than a singer and a songwriter. I'm Greece, Greece. Artie, that was a good friendship. We thought we should express what our generation felt. We are I had a dream that said, you're working on an album called Seven Songs. I want to go and follow the music, but you never know what you're going to find along the way. What I've learned is that when you find a thing that produces a feeling of peace or joy, try and hold on to it. It's like bliss. That's music for me. Thank you so much. That was the trailer for the two-part feature documentary in Restless Dreams. The music of Paul Simon. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. Joining us for a second time is documentary film legend and Oscar winner Alex Gibney. His two-part feature documentary, In Restless Dreams, The Music of Paul Simon, captures the American music legend recording his album Seven Psalms and wrestling with the issues of faith and mortality. What follows is a poignant portrait of the artist as an older man. We also discuss Alex's own creative process, the lessons he's learned from a career in film, and his upcoming film on Elon Musk. Stay tuned. Alex Gibney, welcome back to Factual America. How are things with you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming back. We had you on for Crime of the Century, and so to remind our uh, listeners and viewers, we're talking about In Restless Dreams, the music of Paul Simon. Uh, premiered last year, I believe, at uh, Toronto International Film Festival. It's uh, released this year in the U.S. and Canada. It's uh, currently streaming on MGM+. Plus. Uh, for those in the UK, uh, check out the Altitude website. There will be a theatrical release and later um, streaming as well. So, again, thank you so much for uh, making time for us, Alex, and for coming back on. Um, maybe we can get us started. Uh, tell us what uh, In Restless Dreams, the, I mean, it says it on the, on the label, the music of Paul Simon, but maybe t give us a synopsis of what In Restless Dreams is all about. Well, in Restless Dreams, it's a film about Paul Simon. It kind of exists on two planes, and and that's one of the things that made it exciting for me. Uh, Paul invited me to um, watch him making his new album, uh, yeah. Seven Psalms, and in the process of making it, you know, he was also reckoning with um, some difficulties. I mean, he was losing the hearing in one of his ears. Yeah. Uh, he had some some muscle issues in 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 his uh, fret arm, um, and uh, and and so it was a it, it was an exploration in the present, but also allowed us to then move back and forth, kind of seamlessly, into the past and range widely over mm -hmm. his career. So it's kind of a look at. Um, both art making right. in, in a very deep way, and, and also the 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 extraordinary artistic achievement of Paul Simon. And so, uh, well, speak. I'm I'm actually kind of almost embarrassed. I'm going to ask this, but I'm also reminded, even recently, with like uh, Bill Walton, the basketball great passing, that there's even whole generations that don't aren't aware sometimes of 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 these American icons. Um, I mean, maybe give us a sense for the, our younger genera viewers and listeners um, uh, 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 something about Paul Simon. I'm not, not about a, re a description of his career, but a sense of where he, you know where he stands in sort of American music and culture. I mean, really, he is the background music of my entire life. Yeah. You know, he was he was uh, as a member of first Tom and Jerry, and then 
uh, Simon and Garfunkel. I mean, I've been listening to his music almost since I've been listening to music. Right. Uh, and he's still making it and still making it, uh, you know, effortlessly. And he's one of the uh, great songwriters, one of the greatest songwriters ever mm. uh, yeah. in terms of rock music. So uh, he's a, he's an extraordinary cat. He, the other thing I find interesting about him is that he is a kind of musical explorer. He's right. one of the people who's always been driven to the sounds that are just at the limit of what he can hear yeah. or intriguing sounds that that he finds spark something in him. And they may be completely different to his own tradition or experience, but he follows those sounds and he follows them in ways that, that he invests deeply and learns about where they came from. And then he integrates them into his own kind of personal process. So, right. be, you know, ultimately the, the music becomes very personal to him. But um, but he does it through exploration of stuff he doesn't know, which I you know as a documentarian that's hugely interesting to me because very often you know <laughs> there's that old writing dictum write what you know right uh, I find that only goes so far sometimes it's good to write what you don't know <laughs> exactly. or at least go and, and learn right. uh, about what you don't know and then write about it once you know a little bit more about it and as a documentarian you know I'm always exploring. Right. Um, areas that I didn't know enough about. So, so Paul's curiosity um, and his uh, his his kind of uh, role as a uh, musical explorer is, is is impressive. Well, that's I mean you raise a you raise a good point. There's even a, a early in the doc. Uh, there's even a point where he's you you guys are 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 talking. I mean you're obviously off off, off camera, but uh, you share some. You know he's he's. He's saying you're trying to do the same thing I'm doing, which is trying to find what the story is and how to tell it, isn't it? And That's there's, right. Yeah. No, it's interesting, Paul. I mean, with something like a song, you know, the, the the title "In Restless Dreams" comes from uh, "Sounds of Silence," right? Uh, In restless dreams, I walked alone, and that song was a song that kind of emerged full blown, sort of like the way Dylan describes, you know, Mister Tambourine Man. Right. Just came out of Paul as he was uh, noodling on a on a guitar riff in his um, in the bathroom of his parents' house right. with the water running, so that he could get the the echo off the walls, and it just came to him. But in years after that, he would find bits and pieces. He would keep phrases in his notebooks. He would he would hear um, portions of of tunes or chords that. That he found pleasing, and then over time they would mysteriously <laughs> emerge into something right. that that was a song. And right. so it wasn't something where he sat down with intention and said, "I'm now going to write a song with the following chord changes about the following subject." Right. It didn't happen that way at all. Um, particularly over time, the song writing emerged in a much more sort of intuitive and organic way, even though. He was able to ultimately put it together with with a tremendous amount of songwriting skill. It's one of the things I found so compelling about his process, and 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 something that harmonized indeed with my own process. You know, I started yeah. out early on uh, making documentaries in which I, I I felt I knew pretty much what was important about a film early on, and I rigidly tried to follow right, my initial right. plan and discovered that that was actually a terrible way to make films. Because if right. you weren't exploring, if you weren't open to things right. happening um, in front of you uh, and things that you didn't expect, then you were making a film that was boring. Right. Um, right. And, and so ultimately you have to open yourself up to the idea that um, <laughs> things may explode. <laughs> and, and you have to take account of, and you have to take account of those explorations. There's a, there's a, there's a line in in Paul's um, album Seven Psalms, "Trail of Volcanoes." You know, yes. sometimes that's what a song is. It's a trail of volcanoes. Yeah, I'm still trying to get my head about what he means by that, but uh, you know, no, very good. I mean, so how much of this about his creative process did you know going in, or was it? You just knew he's invited you into to, to Yeah, to... I didn't know that much about his creative process, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew the songs and yeah. some of them very, very well, but I also hadn't broken them down in some kind of essential way. That was another thrill in, in terms mm -hmm. of making this film, was to be able to 
either watch Paul put together music, which was seven psalms, or wa or watch and listen to him breaking down um, how he made previous tracks. Because we had you know right. multi tracks of a lot of his m music going back to a lot of the Simon and Garfunkel stuff, and mm -hmm. and particularly even on Graceland. And to hear him break down those tracks and how they were constructed was really uh, an education. It's it is a revelation, and I think uh, one thing I noted. I think he even says he he wasn't even aware some of the tracks were still available. I think on some of the, even the Simon and Garfunkel stuff. So, yeah, hearing him sit there and uh, well, uh, watching him and as he goes through it, and is it was quite uh, quite eye opening as well. Um, I mean, so the, did you you know talking about? I like this theme of the you know you think. I mean, what were the big what were the big changes? Did you have an idea of what this film was going to be going in, and then following your own rubric, which is that's the worst way to make a film? What what was the big changes as you were going through this and thinking, wait a minute, this film is something different? Well, Paul had approached me initially because he was interested in possibly doing a film, maybe centering on his career, and he had seen a film that I had done about Frank Sinatra. Okay, and so we began to think about the possibilities, and of course, I knew he had a rich catalog, and I. And I asked about his archive, and he had a lot of great materials in the archive, some of which had never been seen by anybody. So that seemed an intriguing film, but it really yeah. wasn't until Paul raised the possibility of coming down and photographing him making mm -hmm. seven psalms that everything changed. I mean, that was a that was a something I didn't anticipate or expect, but uh, I instantly went with it. And I didn't know exactly at that moment how I was going to move back and forth between present and past, but part of that is in the exploration. So it was that excitement about going into something I didn't know anything about, which was a, right. a, an album that I hadn't heard yet. Um, and, and how was that going to connect to the themes of, of his past work? Yeah. I didn't know, but there was only one way to find out. Well, let's, let's talk about that album because um, I have listened to it now. I hadn't before watching your, your film, and it's, it's, it's quite a revelation um, for me personally. Um, poignant haunting and and beautiful i mean there's it's a very interesting story in of itself i mean maybe you can just for our listeners give them a taster of what they're they could be in for when they when they finally if they haven't watched this yet i mean this all starts with january 15th 2019 and he has a dream is so again back to in restless dreams right he has a restless dream yeah. and in the dream uh, there's a there's a, a, a song title or an album title Seven Psalms. Yeah. Psalms is an interesting right phrase too because it, of course it's gift, but it's it's it, it, I mean it, it's a prayer, but it's also P S alms. That is to say, Paul right. Simon gifts. You know, you right. could there's right. a pun. Um, and so he didn't know exactly what it meant, but that he should pay attention to it. And and then there was then a, a guitar riff he had been playing with, and perhaps that was part of Seven Psalms. So it started out very much, it started out with a dream. And then how do you explore the stuff of the unconscious that emerged momentarily right. in that in, in that dream? And and that's what he went out to do. I mean, you said the that for you the album was a revelation. Revelation's a good word. Mm. Because ultimately the album becomes a kind of meditation on um mortality. Yeah. Uh, as well yeah. as a kind of argument he's having with himself about um belief or not. Right. Right. And uh, <laughs> I think a lot of us reckon with Pascal's wager as you know we come closer to death. Right. Uh, is there a life after death or is there not? Uh, right. and, and and we make our peace with that. So so uh, a lot of that was rattling around in his head, but but he didn't just sit back in a kind of schematic way and and beat it out. It emerged slowly over mm -hmm. time uh, as he explored different ideas and themes and then started to give it shape. And was that emerging while you were there? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean he, he had a lot of the verses, but even as I was there, the verses were changing. Hmm. The arrangements were changing, sounds were being integrated. You know, there's some lovely footage in the film with him just working in his right. Uh, right. studio in Wimberley, Texas. Right. Uh, you know, just playing chimes and bells and wondering if if that's the right timber for this moment or 
were, were fiddling on this uh, Harry Parch in instrument, the chromolodeon, where he, he, you hear these kind of weird mm. sort of strident micro tones, which also have a have a strange kind of unearthly beauty to them. And and uh, there's there's one moment where his um, co-producer Kyle Crusham says, you know, Paul says, I don't know, I don't know if that sounds right, and and Kyle says, I think actually it's kind of beautiful, um, <laughs> but it, it it sounds that are being, um, I, I don't know, coerced almost out of yeah. out of this strange instrument. Because what an amazing opportunity. Because I mean, cer certainly there have been documentaries about bands and musicians and them recording albums and things but you're actually capturing those that element this additional element of the creative process as well whereas he's just he's, yeah, so, so, he, he's this, writing both song writing and um the making of an album i mean there were other people that dropped in you know he was working with other musicians there was a lovely session i observed in houston texas in a in a chapel where he was working mm -hmm. with a british group called Vocious eight yeah, and they're a vocal group, and and they're just a hauntingly beautiful sounding mm -hmm. group. Um, and they were, it was a kind of coloration that Paul thought might be right for for the album. And so he was exploring with them yeah. together for a couple of days, <clears throat> and some of the some of what they did, of course, ends up on the album. But it wasn't something that was predetermined. Mm -hmm. It was something they were willing to explore together. Yeah, and then that naturally leads you to this going back and forth, right, between the the current and then his his past and six decades in music. You know, he re makes reference to some album from the 1950s, right? This Bulgarian Voices when he's talking to that, you know, and then that leads to this natural. I mean, it's I guess is it is it maybe the normal al point we we get towards closer to the end of our lives, we start doing more of this kind of retrospective and thinking about where where things have been and how they've led us to where we are now and these sort of things but those things are very much mingled with the present and, and yes. of course our, our haunting thoughts about the future so that's kind of what um, my editor a andy grieve and i tried to reckon with in the making of the film was to create a kind of rhythm for the piece that was sort of a dreamscape where you move seamlessly from present to past to thoughts about the future um that, that that seemed interesting to me and along the way we made some unexpected discoveries as particularly as we were rattling around in the archives i mean you know there was a period of time when he thought his experiment with simon and garfunkel was over their their first album wednesday morning 3 a.m was an right. unadorned failure it was just nobody listened to it and so he took off for england yeah in 64 and it was, it, 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 I didn't really know this, you know, when I started, but, you know, for Paul, that was a really magical moment in his life. He felt a certain kind of freedom because he was there alone. There weren't any commercial expectations for him, but he was playing in small rooms above pubs in and around <clears throat> uh, London. Right. And just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, he was adopted by a strange Eastern <laughs> European woman who had him on this on this radio show called right. Five and uh, and and it ended up being a, a hugely formative and, and romantic experience for him. Yeah, uh, I know. And I I was I have to say I only found out about this recently myself because I was listening to a history of rock and roll podcast that's British UK based here, and they have a whole segment on this. I had no clue that this there's this. It was more than just like one trip. I mean, it was like a few years, wasn't he? That he was over here. Yeah, yeah. It was, UK, it, it, you know. But it, but it, it was uh, it really really focused in that period just before the commercial success of Sound of Silence, which is right. another interesting story that that kind of happened without him even being there. Well, exactly. That's what this pod. Yeah, yeah. And then this very talented, um, uh, extraordinarily talented producer named Tom Wilson, who was working with Bob Dylan in his early electric phase, um, listened to um, Sound of Silence, and it was getting some play on a couple of radio stations, particularly in Boston. And, right. and he wondered, like, well, maybe there's something about this moment that we could integrate into the song. And so without Paul being there, he added drums and electric guitar. Right. And that became the song that became the hit. And it went rocketing to number one. And Paul came back from England, and suddenly he was 
he was yeah. a star. Well, but, well, you know, it, without Tom Wilson, it, it could have yeah. gone a very different way. He might still be here playing in uh, yeah, little in small rooms above pubs. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, the th- what I thought was good too, not to give, well, we're not really giving too much away here, but you know, there I I had heard well he had different views about this, but no, he actually comes out and says, no, I was okay with it. It was fine. You know, I mean, doing the more of an electrical version because what they had done previously was much more. I of wasn't a- sure if he would be offended by it. I mean, he said, yeah. "Look, man, I didn't look. I thought whatever Tom wanted to try because he was a genius." Is, right. is what what Paul kind of said. It's like fine. We didn't. You know, it wasn't like it was burning up the tracks. So <laughs> sure, go ahead, try something. And it turned out to be, you know, extraordinary. And one, I mean, another thing was uh, to continue talking about Paul Simon is that I, I wasn't even really thinking much about this, but there is this, there is this lingering thing about the breakup with Art Garfunkel. I mean, I know a lot gets make up made about that, and probably too much. And it's been, it's as like you, I can't remember, I can't remember a, a time in my life where Paul Simon wasn't around, right? But you know, it was always kind of a running. It even became kind of a running joke or the meme of its time, you know, but it's still there. There are these lingering kind of feelings about um, the breakup of a of a creative collaboration that produces. Well, I think we're all we're all interested in relationships. We're interested in how people get yeah. together and how they break up, and you know, that's what a rock band is. It's kind of a relationship right. with people. And so we're still fascinated by how the Beatles got together and how they, how and why they broke up. Um, right. And it's not unlike the, that with with um, Paul and Art Garfunkel. I mean, they were really they, they knew each other from, I, I, you know, I guess the age of around eight. Yeah. Um, and so they were close, close friends, and then um, became, as, as Paul I think says in the film. To go from somebody who was a really close friend, somebody who really got you, to somebody mm-hmm. you never want to see again, that's a long way. And yeah. uh, we trace the both the, the friendship and the, and the breakup. Uh, and the breakup was kind of a slow motion breakup that happened over a number of years because uh, yeah. Paul was forced to put the group back together again after he right. had had a number of failures in his solo career. Because everybody told him he was crazy to break up Simon and Garfunkel. Mm-hmm. We're a hugely successful group, um, but he wanted to go his own way. And but when it didn't work out, um, they did this famous reunion concert in Central Park. When it didn't work out for Paul as a solo artist, yeah. um, Simon and Garfunkel did this reunion concert in Central Park. Five hundred thousand people showed up. It's uh, one of the first cassettes I ever bought as a kid. Was it? Yeah. That concert? Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing is, I had no idea that that was the roots of it. That that was because Paul's solo career really hadn't flourished as as he had thought, to say the least. Uh, yeah, it, it developed know. sort of organically. You know, initially the idea was that um, Paul would play some songs and then, um, you know, make and then Artie would join him on stage. But he said, it, you know, I didn't want to open for Simon and Garfunkel, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so uh, so ultimately decided, screw it, Let, let's do a whole concert that'll just be Simon and Garfunkel. And then right. a- after that, they tried to put the um, group back together again, but it didn't work. Once yeah. Humpty Dumpty had fallen, there was no way to put it back together again. Yeah. Well, I think that actually is a. a- Good chance here to give our uh, listeners and viewers a break. We'll be right back with uh, Alex Gibney, the award-winning director of In Restless Dreams, the music of Paul Simon, streaming on MGM Plus in North America. And do check out the Altitude website where you'll find out when it will be showing here in the UK. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or X to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. We're here with Oscar-winning director Alex Gibney discussing his most recently released documentary, In Restless Dreams, the music of Paul Simon, streaming on MGM Plus in North America. Alex, what's, uh, so we've been having this great, you know, uh, really enjoying this discussion about Paul Simon, what you discovered when you went there and his creative process and, and the man that, that 
to sort of a portrait of uh, the artist as an older man, at the to say the least. Um, what is the main challenge in making a doc about an American icon? I mean, you've got six decades of archive. He's spent his whole career, life almost since he was fifteen, even in the public eye. How do you? Where do you? Where do you begin? Or do you not worry about that and just let it? No let problem it roll? about where to begin. The, the 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 issue is where do you end? Right. And, uh, and and the peril and promise of such a rich career is that you want to focus on things and you want to let the music play at length, but that inevitably means that you don't have room for everything. And, you know, people point out that there are huge sections of his career, particularly post Rhythm of the Saints, where, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of left off um, and, 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 and didn't treat as equally as, um, if, if at all, as some of the earlier period. But I didn't want to make a Wikipedia. Exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I kind of followed, um, I kind of followed my, nose or yeah. might i should say um in terms of figuring out what was important to the film that was intuitively emerging out of what was coming out of seven psalms we do kind of structure it roughly along the lines of seven psalms and play sort of mm. bits and pieces of seven psalms in a way that's you know true to, to true to the chronology of the album yeah uh, but along the way then how and when we dip back into the past, you know, became a, a a process of trial and error, and also something that leaned into the themes that were coming out of Seven Psalms. So mm. it wasn't something that was so, you know, you you don't sit down and say, okay, well, we got to put in Crotochrome. Well, Crotochrome right. isn't, you know, and, <laughs> exactly. and some of my favorite songs like Further to Fly or or um, Renee and Georgette Magritte with their dog after the war. They're not right. in. Yeah. And how does that happen? Like, I'm the director. I, I should be able to put it in. <laughs> but at some point, the movie starts to speak to you in a way that's powerful, and you you don't listen to it at its, at, at, at your peril. Mm. So it it um, it emerged slowly but surely. And also, it depended kind of on on materials we found too. <clears throat> I mean, we uh, we learned that Paul had in his archive. All of the ISO cams from the famous um, Harare concert, Harare Zimbabwe concert, right? That was done by the uh, Graceland band, as yeah. well as Miriam Makeba and Hugh Masekela, right? Um, back in the day, and and so we leaned into that because it was such extraordinary material that people hadn't seen before, and we even found a lovely story about, uh, you know, Paul recalled that. There was a moment where they played uh you can call me al right <laughs> and um i mean that was the story he was telling me you know just as we were sitting around and and that after the song the response was so rapturous that uh, his guitarist uh, ray peary came over to him and said you know man they want you to play it again and paul was like well yeah that that's what they may want but we're going on <laughs> we're gonna do this next song and ray leaned over to paul and this is according to his Paul's telling and says, no man, we're going to play it again. And so they played it again. Now that sounded like a good story, but you know, memory is a fickle thing. So we went right. back to the archive and we found the ISO cams and that is exactly what happened. And it's a kind of a magical moment in the movie, right. Um, right. you know, cause it's, it's rare in the middle of a set, you know, the audience is so enraptured with a song that they, they call you out and say, you got to play that song again right now. Right, right. Or you're not getting out of Harare if you don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not leaving the stage until you play. I mean, in doing this film, did you discover anything new about yourself or your own creative process? I did. I mean, I, I think that I should say it reinforced some ideas that I've been having about how to make films. And there's something that I think um, in this notion of um, allowing for the intuitive process to mm -hmm. guide you and yet also using your skill that you've accumulated over the years right. in order to be able to render it in a way that's, you know, translatable to, uh, to your viewers, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that's something I, I felt I got a lot out of and, you know, 
I'm also uh, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, they say that rock and roll is a young man's game, but that's only true when you're young. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> the, older, you know, the older you get, the more you think, well, maybe it's not just such a young man's game. And you, and you think right. like, I think the colors of the sunset are more interesting than the colors of the sunrise. And, the, and so there was something about that aspect to it that mm. was very alluring and interesting to me that instead of trying to pretend that, um, you know, Paul wasn't 81 or that I'm not 71. I, I lean into that right. aspect of old age, which I think is um, actually inspiring right. and, uh, and, uh, and liberating. So that was fun. Yeah. And I think even as it's, I, I think it's, an, it's at least alluded to his, even getting back to Paul, his, his own songs change, you know, over, it's like any work of, you know, art or fiction or poetry, or whatever, the meanings change over time. And as as even says, some of the some of the references early on don't we don't even get them anymore. Probably for those we don't get them, know. but it, maybe it doesn't matter. As, as Paul exactly. said, the, the audience completes the meaning. I mean, there were certain song, there were certain references in songs that I had sung to myself hundreds of times, like "Only Living Boy in New York." It's right, uh, right. He starts off, Tom, get, catch your plane ride on time. I was like, Tom, who this, who's this Tom? And of course, that refers to Tom of Tom and Jerry, which was the original right. incarnation of, of uh, Simon and Garfunkel. And, you know, he's talking about um, Artie Garfunkel as he's going down to film um, uh, the, you know, Catch-22 with Mike right. Nichol. But uh, so you, you learn. And yeah. and at the end of the day, does it really matter? Because the song is carrying you through, and it could be Tom, it could be Ed, it could be Bob. Yeah, you know the that's the that's the magical thing about music. Right, you kind of bring your own meaning to it that that is beyond what the um, what the author or the player may have intended. Well, and if, he's an, even as he says, some of the stream of consciousness stuff, he just runs with it, and then it's only later that he realizes it kind of. Not even so yeah, much the meaning, but it has the, a resonance. That was, that was the writing of Graceland, right? Because he kept yeah. thinking, like, I keep, you know, I keep coming back to this, these words, Graceland, Graceland. It's like, yeah. what the hell does this have to do with this music that I just recorded in South Africa? Yeah. Um, but then he decided, okay, well, maybe I'm my unconscious is telling me something. Maybe I have to explore. So right. he took a trip to Graceland, yeah. Elvis's uh, mansion. And and uh, and that becomes the basis of the song, which is a journey, really, for a father and a son, mm. um, and with with thoughts of lost love and so forth and so on. So, yeah. you know, it <clears throat> just that that insinuation of a word yeah. into his unconscious um, propels him on a journey that takes him to an extraordinary place, <laughs> which is Graceland. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And in this, what was interesting is uh, back to his creative process, he talks about, or someone says he's got this ear for the irritant, or that's a common phrase he uses. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, do you have an ear or an eye for the irritant? Is that something that all f artists and filmmakers must have? I think you do to some extent. I would not say that my ear goes to the irritant as insistently as Paul does. Yeah. Sometimes, particularly in documentary, there's an aspect of it where, unlike some fiction films, right, where you 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 kind of embrace the irritant. Well, the either the irritant or the imperfections, you right. know. And I think right. Paul is driven to make things kind of perfect. And and one of the things that Wynton Marsalis, who's a friend of Paul's, yeah. who is uh, f featured as a voice throughout this film, um, says, you know. If things were a little out of tune, you should leave them there because that's what the struggle is. You should leave some of that struggle in. Right. And Paul admits, like, I can't do that because if I hear it, it just annoys me too much. I have to fix it. But maybe I will listen to how maybe right. there's another way that I could leave the struggle in because that's right. part of what the making of the – that's part of what the record is all about is the mm. struggle of making the record itself. So I would say that I, I, I think Paul's – 
the way that Paul's ear goes to the irritant is a little bit more insistent than mine. I'm I'm kind of like, well, you, you only you you only make it so good this time around, and then you see what the next film is going to be like. That said, <clears throat> I usually work with editors whose ear is oh, extremely attuned to the irritant, so good. there's usually a nice balance yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, because I know you also executive produce things. We had, uh, most recently, we had uh, Alex Stapleton, who did an episode of God Save Texas on. Um, I mean, what do you look for in a project before you put your name to it? One that you're not directly, like, directing or, you know, closely involved with. I look to uh, an artist or I look to a story. I mean, yeah. you know, I I'm delighted to invest in the exploration of artists who are just mm -hmm. trying to find their way into a subject or a story. And then in other cases, I look for a story. Because I often ask the question, you know, because what, what comes to me a lot are projects, you know, n not so related to the, to, the, to, to the films I do on either, uh, you know, musicians or athletes, but right. the, the more investigative ones. You know, people right. are always come to me, you should do a film about poverty or you should do a film about X subject. And, you know, my response is usually, well, what's the story? Right. Because stories are the, are, 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 stories are powerful. And that's what really causes people to be moved emotionally rather than presentations of facts. That's the phone book, yeah, right? Yeah. There, there's an extremely schematic and accurate presentation of facts in the phone book or what used to be called the phone book. Right. Before right. We had, yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's what that's what I'm interested in is artists and and stories. Okay, and um, I mean you must get tired of these kind of questions because. <laughs> but in terms of like, if you were starting out now, what kind of what bit of advice would you like to receive? I'm always reluctant to give advice, or um, yeah, um, but I I do think that maybe the best piece of advice is enjoy the journey, uh, yeah. and not yeah. too much the destination. Because if you're enjoying the journey, then you'll always find a way to get someplace interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really make my first feature documentary until I was 50. Now, I'd made some TV docs. Um, right, and, right. And, and I'd been a, a scripted film editor. And I, you know, I, but, um, but I didn't kind of find my way mm -hmm. and, uh, as a director until, right. you know, quite late in my career. Yeah. So uh, that's why I would say, you know, enjoy the journey and also find stuff that makes the work along the way personal to you. Right. Like, that's another thing people ask me all the time is like, how do you pick your projects? And very often the ones that <laughs> are easiest to fund are the ones where a funder comes to you and says, how about doing a film on this? Right. Um, and you could say, well, I didn't think of that. Uh, and then move on. Or you could say, well, hmm, is there something in that assignment that's mm -hmm. interesting to me personally? Yeah. yeah. And if so, then you can invest in it. And speaking of, I guess, projects that must be close to you, I mean, and we're coming to the end of our time together, I, I think. Um, I think it's well known. You're next. You've, we usually ask our guests, what's next for you? I guess Musk is in post-production. Is that that's uh, that's uh, that's when is that releasing and how's that going? It's going well. Um, it's in a combination of production and post production. We're editing and yeah. and and shooting simultaneously. But I think it's going to be um, um, I think it's going to be quite good. Okay. Well, I can't wait to see it. It's the one when I when I say I'm going to uh, I was going to get a chance to uh, have a little chat with you. Everyone's like, are you going to talk about Musk? <laughs> So, I yeah, know it's I'm, one. I'm, I'm going to let the film speak for itself. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Well, and what I would also tell him is, yes, we're all looking forward to Musk, but don't pass up on this one. This was a little. This was a gem. I'm really glad I uh, had a chance to uh, to to watch it and discover this album and to talk to you about it. So, thank you again. And just to remind our listeners and viewers, we're here. We've been talking with Oscar-winning director Alex Gibney about uh, his film in restless dreams the music of paul simon streaming on ngm plus in north america do check it out thanks again for joining us on factual america 
A big shout out to everyone at Intersound Audio in York, England for their great studio and fine editing and production skills. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, which specializes in documentaries, television, and shorts about the U.S. for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is factualamerica.com.